good afternoon uh, everyone and uh, also thank you for the uh, welcome remarks and setting the context uh, PIDS Vice President uh, Ben Ballesteros. Um, I'm grateful for the research assistance uh, provided uh, excellently by uh, research associate uh, Cristina Ortiz and uh, uh, research analyst uh, Jethro Camara. Uh, so here's my presentation. I hope that uh, everyone is seeing this clearly. Uh, for a fuller discussion of this, uh, by the way, uh, I invite you to read uh, PIDS discussion paper 2022-16 on the OPSF and the downstream oil industry deregulation lead us not into reversal temptation and deliver us from obfuscation. Uh, it was released uh, last May 9. Okay, so let's proceed. So th this will be my uh, discussion flow. I'll first trace the origin and demise of the OPSF, then uh, discuss the risks of reviving it, and uh, a few rem remaining countries with a uh, similar fund the premise in and promises of deregulation, the possible policy responses are given uh, the uh, uh, seeming temptation to reverse a uh, policy, and then other ways forward and uh, final remarks uh, on behalf of the poor. Now on the origin and demise of the OPSF, um, usually uh, policymakers and academics uh, trace the history of the OPSF from 1984, but uh, it's better to trace it uh, uh, in 1971, the start of heavy regulation. But uh, before that, uh, before 1971, uh, there's free market in the downstream oil industry. There's freedom of entry and exit by firms and price was not regulated by the government. And then in 1971, RA 6173 was enacted uh, and this established the Oil Industry Commission to regulate the domestic prices. It also created a special fund, uh, which later became known as the Oil Industry uh, Special Fund. Uh, it had broad uses for um, uh, even for research, but it was also used in profit regulation and price stabilization. So this is the, the origin of a, a fund for price stabilization. And then in 1979, a, a, a special fund was carved out of that uh, uh, oil industry special fund, and it's called consumer price equalization. Then this fund had eroded uh, by 1983 and it was abolished, but the abolition of uh, uh, this equalization fund uh, for, uh, for, for a specific price stabilization was uh, um, short-lived because in 1984, the OPSF was created. It was created through Presidential Decree 1956, which uh, imposed uh, uh, new taxes and re revised specific taxes uh, because uh, of uh, the economic crisis that uh, uh, we were encountering at that time. And th that is to help the cash-trapped and uh, heavily indebted government. The law also declared the OPSF as the mechanism for stabilizing the petro uh, prices of petroleum products. Now let's uh, look at the design of the OPSF. So uh, what are the contributions? These uh, were the increase in uh, ad valorem taxes and customs duties on petroleum products and as well as the increase in tax collection because uh, some exemptions on government corporations were lifted at the time and the law also provided that any additional tax imposed uh, should go to the OPSF. Now the claims against the OPS OPSF, these uh, were the reimbursements to oil companies for their uh, import cost increases uh, because of exchange rate adjustments and world price movements. The price setting was set every two months. So in two months time, price prices uh, were stable. Then uh, the design evolved. There were changes uh, in 1985 and 1987. So in 1985, um, cost savings by companies uh, due to uh, price changes, market forces, and the ad valorem tax changes, these were considered contributions to the OPSF. And uh, in 1987, the contributions were expanded further by including the positive cost differentials uh, between the costs fixed by the regulator 
uh, the, the 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 costs that uh, were allowed to be charged no and then the actual import cost by the oil companies and the utilization was also expanded by including uh, as reimbursables the under recoveries of uh, the oil companies during the regulatory reset periods of two months then eventually our policy makers uh, realized that uh, there were frequent occurrence of uh, deficits or mismatches between payments and claims and uh, this required um, subsidies uh, through the general fund through the national budget and then at the same time um, needed investments and services were not coming especially for island provinces and the municipalities so we needed investments greater than those being provided by the so-called big three oil companies at the time the big three were petron shell and caltex so the regulation was uh, first introduced in 1996 through ra 8180 however the supreme court declared this as un unconstitutional and uh, cited uh, three uh, provisions uh, which uh, were deemed un um, unconstitutional the four percent tariff differential between imported crude oil and refined petroleum products the minimum inventory requirement for oil companies serving uh, as barrier to entry for new companies and then the definition of uh, predatory pricing which uh, was unsatisfactory you know it, it won't uh, deter anti-competitive behavior so the legislators addressed the constitutionalities, uh, constitutionality issues and by 1998 uh, they came up with RA 8479 which fully deregulated the downstream oil industry and abolished the OPSF. Now every time there's oil, cri oil crisis uh, we see a temptation to reverse the deregulation policy. You, you'll see that if you will revisit uh, the local news in 2008 you know, when speculative uh, bubble was uh, building up in 2011 when supply shortages occurred due to the arab spring movements in 2017 to 2018 due to the high demand growth uh, prior to the oil crash uh, in in 2018 that's uh, when the oil crash ha happened and then in october 2021 when um demand the uh, economic demand jump uh, when uh, covid induced mobility restrictions were relaxed and then recently, due to the Russia-Ukraine war, and along with the uh, revisiting of the uh, deregulation, there are also calls for the revival of the OPSF. Okay, now what are the risks of reviving the OPSF? So we're looking at the risks um, based on our historical experience. First is the risk of mismatches between sources of and claims against the price stabilization fund so we've seen that uh, instead of being self-financing the opsf had to receive transfers from the national budget and in 1990 uh, it, the transfer was uh, uh, huge uh, it was 5 billion and equivalent uh, at present to 25.59 billion uh, it was uh, uh, through Republic Act uh, 6592. Another risk is the temptation to use the OPSF for other purposes. Now, this, this is not uh, unique to Philippine policymakers. Policymakers in other countries uh, uh, are also tempted that way. You'll see in one country that uh, uh, the price stabilization fund um, was used for, for a different purpose uh, in in one of my uh, uh, succeeding slides. Uh, an example in our case is uh, in 1992, uh, legislators allowed the use of the OPSF for the payment of uh, capital stock subscription to the National Power Corporation, and that's uh, through the enactment of uh, RA 7639. Another risk is wavering political will. So how sure are we that uh, our policymakers will uh, really implement the needed price increases, especially when the magnitude was large, uh, which uh, uh, becomes necessary when our world uh, uh, oil prices are large. And uh, in fact, that happened uh, in 1994, na the government even backed 
peddled on price increases uh, it planned to implement. It was uh, uh, recorded in a, uh, a report by the International Monetary Fund, and that contributed uh, to the further erosion of the OPSF. Another risk is the uh, possible occurrence of a lengthy legal challenges to the OPSF credits and payments, and uh, this can be costly as um, illustrated in uh, the case of uh, Shell's uh, government, government uh, 1991 claim that Shell had underpayment of uh, contributions. So there were uh, back and forth uh, claims and counterclaims between the government and Shell. And then uh, in it was only in 2008 that the uh, final ruling was um, uh, given by the Supreme Court and uh, the government uh, lost the case. Okay, another risk is um, the possibility of uh, unintended uh, consequences. And uh, here uh, in the OPSF experience, so we had the unintended uh, effects of price distortion wherein the uh, use of carbon intensive diesel was intensified, uh, incentivized and um, it, this is because uh, the way the OPSF was designed at that time, the government set the regulated price for premium gasoline higher than the computed price uh, in order to keep the diesel price low. So purportedly, this is to help um, sector, sectors such as the public transport sector, uh, agriculture, and uh, fisheries. So in effect, there was cross subsidization. But uh, this encouraged consumers to shift to diesel, which uh, emits more carbon, so including uh, SU, the SUV riding public. Now, um, some may argue, but uh, hey, there are still uh, a fuel price stabilization funds in other countries. Yes, that is true. But there are only a few of them that uh, remained with the fuel price stabilization funds. Uh, we can we've counted them and only four remaining uh, perhaps there are more but uh, uh, based on our rigorous uh, research so we, we've looked uh, e even at a uh, loss in uh, their own national languages and we we, we uh, translated uh, the national laws to to check uh, how whether uh, the uh, fuel price stabilization funds are uh, designed uh, uh, similar to the concept of, uh, you know, um, uh, OPSF or or something close to it, and um, if we have uh, missed something, that's probably because the, uh, due to um, an availability of uh, of uh, easily translatable uh, national laws. But uh, we've counted four. So first is Thailand. Th Thailand established its oil fund in 1979 so uh, by the way uh, we excluded uh, no, uh, exporting countries so we focus on uh, net oil importing countries because uh, uh, for obvious an obvious reason the exporting countries uh, can very well afford um, fuel price stabilization funds for their consumers so first thailand thailand established its oil fund in 1979 and it's uh, now known as the oil fuel fund so it, it it was used to stabilize domestic prices, but the expense of having a deficit. So pare pareho, almost of, uh, all of them have deficit, or not not almost, but all of all the four have deficits. So as of March 2022, uh, Thailand's fund is incurring loans of 20 million uh, Thai baht and to support the spikes in subsidies due to the Russia-Ukraine war. Vietnam. In 2009, uh, the Vietnamese government passed uh, this law setting aside price valorization funds. Initially, um, that was successful, but uh, the funds have not been able to prevent price increases uh, for oil in the country. And in fact, uh, in the last year, it registered a negative balance of 600 billion Vietnamese dong. Malawi. Malawi established its uh, price stabilization fund in 2004. 
but uh, it was reported to be impotent in stabilizing oil prices and preventing oil supply shortages. And in fact, uh, the government was criticized for using the fund for another purpose, for a purpose different from uh, petroleum price stabilization. It was used to fund the purchase of maize or corn uh, in, into 2016. In Chile, so in Latin American countries, um, price stabilization funds uh, were uh, removed, uh, except for Chile. Uh, some uh, amount uh, has remained, but uh, that's only uh, very small, and it's dedicated for household consumed kerosene. So the, the, the funds established in 1991 helped mitigate uh, drastic price increases. No? Uh, so only a small portion remained, uh, but uh, the uh, keeping of this fund necessitated, uh, or keeping this fund functional necessitated the transfer of money from other funds, such as uh, when uh, $7 billion of uh, copper funds were transferred to the oil fund in 2008. No? So, uh, so it's a bit, uh, no, uh, similar to us, um, to, to our case. No, now we're using, uh, na, or we use non OPSF fund. No? We use the national budget. In their case, they use the, the copper fund uh, to subsidize the oil fund. Now, let's uh, focus on understanding the premise and in and promises of the regulation because. Uh, this uh, will help um, and let's focus our if we are going to have information campaign let's let's uh, focus our information campaign on on uh, making the public understand the premise and promises of the regulation so that uh, uh, the temptation to backslide on reforms uh, could be lessened um, Price regulation, the first premise is that price regulation is not effective because uh, external events that led to price spikes and crashes are usually major world events. And it's difficult for a small importing country like the Philippines to, to maintain uh, prices. No, it's, uh, it's costly. And besides, there are less distortionary and more effective uh, instruments for uh, mitigating the adverse uh, consequences of uh, high world uh, prices. So let's uh, uh, look at this uh, graph. No? This is an illustration of uh, major world events from the 1860s uh, to the present. And uh, you can see that uh, even during the uh, 2010 to 19, uh, period, uh, it's the, in terms of real prices. You no, know, the the levels are similar to the 1860s uh, Pennsylvania oil boom, but we survived and uh, without a price stabil stabilization fund. Another, uh, and now uh, let's look at the premises of the regulation. The, the reg oil industry the regulation law did not promise to lower prices. It never promised uh, low prices or it never promised um, uh, stopping the price increases. Instead, it set as a policy goal a truly competitive market under a regime of fair prices. So two keywords, com competition and fair pricing. So since the 19... 98 the regulation greater competition in the market has been achieved and uh, we needed that we needed to improve quality of petroleum products and expand the oil industry coverage to serve underserved areas you know island provinces and island municipal municipalities so if uh, you will notice from the the uh, market share of the big three uh, from 1998 to 2021. So in 1998, they they, they dominated um, the oil downstream oil industry. Uh, but in 2021, the share of the big three um, 
it's now smaller at uh, 49 uh, percent and uh, in fact there are now 400 firms participating in the downstream oil industry with a cumulative investment of 209.5 billion on fair pricing so fair prices uh, means not uh, too high to the benefit of our producers and to the detriment of consumers nor too low uh, to the detriment of uh, uh, non-oil consumers because that will involve uh, subsidies no um Fair, so fair pricing is what's promised by the the regulation law, and there had been three independent uh, reviews uh, in 2005 by an independent uh, review committee uh, formed by the DOE in 2008 um, through uh, the SGV and the University of Asia and the Pacific study team. And uh, in 2012, through an independent review committee uh, formed by the DOE again. So all of these uh, three uh, reviews found that profit margins of firms were reasonable. And in fact, the return on equity, um, the average return on equity by firms uh, even declined after the regulation. Now, uh, what? are the possible policy responses and first uh before before discussing the policy responses uh, let me emphasize that uh, the highly recommended strategy is uh, reform durability no and how do we do that lack in reforms we lack in reforms and that's true for for other uh, sectors uh, wherein their there are temptations to have policy ref uh, reversal. So lack in reforms, lack in reforms by making commitments to stay the course through legislative amendments and uh, supplemental issuances that cement and improve rather than reverse the reforms. So uh, here uh, I'll be discussing um, uh, policies on min minimum inventory requirement retail price on bundling and strategic oil reserves so for the minimum inventory requirement so you may recall that uh, this was struck down as unconstitutional by the supreme court in 1997 because a barrier to entry for new firms at the time but note that the current environment is markedly different from what the supreme court appreciated in 1997 besides the doe is already um, implementing uh, the minimum inventory requirement, uh, but through department circulars. No, uh, what's needed is to uh, legislate uh, this uh, policy uh, because uh, it will guarantee continuous domestic supply, discourage fly-by-night operators, and th those are uh, reasons that our um, considered by our policy makers in uh, 1996. No? So this time, uh, this will not be considered as providing unfair advantage to uh, existing players because the industry now enjoys uh, greater competition than before. Another uh, proposal is a retail price and bundling, and this is in fact uh, contained in uh, House Bill 10823. So the aim there is to separate petroleum prices uh, based on its components, such as landed cost, port charges, refining cost, storage cost, handling costs, marketing costs, and transshipment costs. So the objective is to promote transparency and fair pricing and to help spot uh, anti-competitive practices such as predatory pricing or even uh, smuggling. Now, this is currently being opposed by industry players, and I'm glad that uh, we have uh, a discussion from the private sector. Uh, uh, he may be able to uh, elucidate uh, more on this. Strategic oil reserves. This is uh, another uh, possible policy response. And uh, note that uh, this is uh, uh, already being implemented uh, in our 
uh, neighbors. So Asian neighbors with the strategic oil reserves uh, include uh, the, the advanced countries, uh, Japan, South Korea, China also has a strategic oil reserve. And then our closer neighbors, um, Thailand and Taiwan, they also have strategic oil reserves. Now, government uh, participation in uh, holding oil reserves, uh, I think, may help generate uh, industry consensus on uh, compliance uh, with the minimum inventory requirement. As long as it is clear that the government-owned uh, oil stocks are strictly for contingencies and uh, not meant to compete with the private sector. So, uh, in the during oil supply disruptions, uh, it is in everybody's interest to avoid economic losses. So the private sector, the industry player should be interested in that also, no? uh, and uh, interested to ensure a critical level of supply is uh, available. And that is through uh, an ag aggregate strategic reserve composed of uh, their um, stockpile through the minimum inventory requirement and the government stockpile through um, a, a uh, policy on uh, government holding of uh, strategic oil reserves. Now, the proposal is for the uh, PNOC to do the stockpiling. It's not uh, yet articulated in the National Energy Plan that was prepared in 2002, but uh, the PIDS uh, uh, got an update from uh, the, the uh, DOE that the National Energy Plan is being updated. Now, there are other ways forward. Targeted subsidy program, that's already an existing policy, so it's not something new, but there could be improvements. And then energy efficiency programs, there are already existing policies on this. And then diversification of uh, energy supply sources, that's already uh, uh, a long-standing uh, strategy that uh, always appears in the Philippine Energy Plan. Now for um, the targeted subsidy, before discussing that, let's uh, look at the um, fuel uh, excise tax suspension uh, proposal. So it's, um, it, it's, uh, it was proposed uh, by uh, legislators and uh, opposed by the Department of Finance. And uh, this is because um, uh, and, and the PIDS agrees with this, this because it would result in fiscal revenue losses. No? And uh, uh, in 2022, it's estimated to be 105.9 billion. And uh, look at this table, table one. Look at uh, the richest 10%, the 10th decile. So they are consuming or they are spending uh, 34. Point uh, th their fuel spending is 34.34% of the total. The next decile, the ninth decile, 16.27%. Uh, so the uh, the richest 20%, uh, their their expenditure, their spending on uh, fuel is uh, about 50% uh, of the total uh, fuel expenditure. Compare that with the poorest 10%, their fuel spending is 1.39%. The second poorest decile, 2.67%. So, so the, the poorest 20%, um, the, their total fuel spending is only close to 4% of the total fuel uh, expenditure in the economy. So that means those who can very well afford fuel price increases will stand to benefit more from fuel price declines if we will suspend the fuel excise taxes. So in lieu of uh, fuel excise tax suspension, it's better to target the, those who are most affected by fuel price increases and target them through subsidies. So that's the better option. But uh, there need to be improvements in the timing, coordination, and efficiency in distribution as well as the generousness of the amounts, given uh, the issues that we've been hearing about uh, programs like Pantawid Pasada and the uh, delays in the 
programs, fuel subsidy programs for the agriculture and fishery sector. Uh, another existing policy that we have is the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act of 2019. So that's needed for demand management. And this can help mitigate the impacts of uh, oil price peaks. But uh, the COVID-19 pandemic made um, private sector compliance uh, extra challenging. So rather than spend uh, on uh, technology that uh, will uh, make them comply with the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act of 2019, they, they, they'd rather spend on uh, keeping their businesses whole. So the government and financing partners should help facilitate uh, firms transition toward energy efficient options. And uh, for the long term, we need to have diverse diversification of uh, energy supply resources. So we need to improve the enforcement of uh, existing renewable energy related laws. Uh, we need to support this uh, through um, strategies like uh, having an ancillary services market in the electricity market. And uh, we also have to uh, be serious in uh, pursuing uh, the activities and strategies related to uh, indigenous oil and gas exploration and development. So the Philippine Energy Plan 2020 to 2040 has declarations on this. But uh, earnestness in plans must be matched by resoluteness in actions. Now, as uh, we have seen from um, the analysis, there are two major strands of uh, policy thinking uh, that are emerging. Um, uh, first, reinstate the OPSF, reversing the downstream oil industry deregulation in the process. And second, uh, rewrite the industry rules through such amendments as uh, price and bundling and uh, minimum inventory requirement. Uh, with the latter contributing to strategic uh, stockpiling. Um, policymakers should assess which of these two is more tolerable for the industry uh, players. And the uh, industry players, on the other hand, should be interested in measures that uh, will lead to reform durability rather than reform reversal. And I think more importantly, the effects on the poor should be well assessed by both policymakers and the industry players so that uh, previous and the uh, upcoming reforms would be more acceptable to the public. So we should pursue development objectives in a way that does not burden the poor. So that's the better approach. And uh, reviving the OPSF, I think, will be anti-poor in at least three respects. First, given that it is usually the rich who consume a higher volume of petroleum, the subsidy from the poor will disproportionately benefit the rich more than the poor. Second, reviving the OPSF will likely result in the national government having to bail out the special fund using the general fund, the, the national budget. So displacing funding for anti-poverty programs in the process. And third, because there are many players now in the downstream oil industry, administering the OPSF will be very costly. And the huge cost will be disproportionately be borne by the poor. So I think programs on targeted assistance to the poor is preferable to the OPSF. So thank you for this uh, opportunity for us in PIDS to contribute to uh, socioeconomic development through policy research.